It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search it out is the glory of kings. This is the Message to Kings podcast. Episode 159, Judgment of the House of Ahab. So a preface to this murderous account this week. Two kings and the queen mother are going to die. And it's straight out of the Bible. I'm going to read more directly from the Bible this week just because of its flow and context are all we need. We'll spend less time on commentary and more on just reading these accounts. So here's a disclaimer. If you've got small children around, please be aware this is one of the Uh, More intense stories in all the Bible. All right, so here we go. Upon the death of Ben-Hadad in the last regular episode, everything happens rather quickly. Haziel, potentially rallying his army that had previously ran away from Samaria, is now turning it around and redirecting it back to Israel to attack Israel. They marched straight down to Ramoth-Gilead, where Joram was headed, and he had actually taken the city. And further, Joram entices his nephew-in-law, King Isaiah of Judah, to join him in keeping Aram out of Israel. Isaiah wants a piece of the action because his, his family member to the north just took so much spoil in the last campaign. It seemed like a good idea because the prophet Elisha was on his side and Aram was just defeated in a most remarkable way. But these two kings didn't realize the season and the spirit had already changed. Judgment was coming to the house of Ahab. Two kings against one. The demoralized Aramean should be no match for Israel, right? But not this king. King Haziel was empowered by God to even be another instrument of judgment on the house of Ahab. Battles for Ramoth Gilead, which historically go bad for Israel, was a disaster. King Joram was wounded. In fact, he was wounded. Josephus goes so far as to say he was wounded, and he went back to Jezreel to heal from his wounds, while the commander of Israel's army, Jehu, actually takes the city. And at this point, the nephew-in-law, King Isaiah, goes to Jezreel. And he goes to Jezreel to check on Joram, who is wounded. So we leave the two kings in the walled city of Jezreel, while Jehu is in Ramoth Gilead celebrating his victory. So Jehu, with the rest of the army, is licking their wounds and looking after the wounded with his commanders. In fact, I've got a feeling, I mean, there's this victory celebration that they took the city. And in fact, he may be even drunk, by the way, it's kind of speaking of Jehu, with his officials also, maybe they're complaining of the battle and blaming the king because the king was wounded and he fled the battle. In fact, I, I get the feeling that the soldiers and the commanders are pretty furious with the king, King Joram, who nearly cost them the battle and the lives of their comrades who died or were wounded in the battle. They even speak of this new Haziel, a son of nobody, who now ruled the entire kingdom of Aram. How could a son of nobody become king of Aram? Maybe there were suggestions and jest. Serious, but in high spirits, that the Jehu himself should be king. No doubt this conversation had been going on probably for some time, for the officers only needed a little push in that direction, and the Lord had already prepared his heart for such a thing. The season of judgment was at hand. Now it was Israel's turn. 2 Kings 9 The prophet Elisha summoned a man from the company of the prophets and said to him, Tuck your cloak in your belt, take this flask of olive oil with you, and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you get there, look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Go to him, get him away from his companions, and take him in the inner room. Then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, This is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run, and do not delay. So Elisha knows the terror that would soon follow. He doesn't even want to be there himself. He assigns one of his junior staff to do the job. And further, he says, anoint him and run. Basically, don't get caught in the crossfire. Anoint him and run, he commands him. 
2 Kings 9, 4. So the young prophet went to Ramoth Gilead, and when he arrived, he found an army officer sitting, all the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which of us, asked Jehu. For you, commander, he replied. Jehu got up, went to his house. Then the prophet poured oil on Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people, Israel. You to destroy the house of Ahab, your master, and I avenge the blood of my servants. The prophets, the blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off every last male in Israel of the line of Ahab, slave or free. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, son of Ahijah. As for Jezebel, dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. Then he opened the door and ran. When Jehu went out with his fellow officers, one of them asked him, Is everything all right? Why did this maniac come to you? You know the man and the sort of things he says, Jehu replied. That it's not true, they said. Tell us. Jehu said, Here is what he told me. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. They quickly took their cloaks and spread them out under him on the bare steps. They blew their trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. Just like that, the gangster-like figure of Jehu becomes king. His officers were in total agreement, and they only encouraged him. Jehu's assignment is terrible and dirty. The spirit realm would be judged. Jezebel and all that she represented would be overthrown in a moment. Jehu will thoroughly, if not thoroughly, achieve this task. Immediately, he, with fury and incredible zeal, he went for the throat of his adversary. And considering the zeal, it's almost like he's some kind of induced rage as well, because it's so bizarre how it all goes down. He goes to Jezreel with his entire army, not just him. He just turned his army around and left the city that he just took and marched to Jezreel to besiege his own capital. 2 Kings 9.14 so Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Jehu said, If you desire to make me king, don't let anyone slip out of the city to go and tell the news in Jezreel. Then he got into his chariot and rode to Jezreel, because Joram was resting there, and Hiza, king of Judah, went gone down to see him. When the lookout standing on the tower in Jezreel saw Jehu's troops approaching, he called out, I see some troops coming. Get a horseman, Joram ordered. Send him to meet him and ask him, Do you come in peace? The horseman rode off to meet Jehu and said, This is what the king says. Do you come in peace? What do you have to do with peace? Jehu replied. Fall in line behind me. The lookout reported the messenger has reached him, but he isn't coming back. So the king sent out a second horseman, and when he came to him, he said, This is what the king says. Do you come in peace? Jehu replied, What do you have to do with peace? Fall in behind me. The lookout reported, He has reached him, but he isn't coming back either. He's driving like Jehu, son of Nimshi. He drives like a maniac. Hitch up my chariot, Joram ordered. And when it was hitched, Joram, king of Israel, and Ahiza, king of Judah, rode out, each in their own chariot, to meet Jehu. They met him at the plot of ground that had belonged to Naboth, the Jezreelite. And when Joram saw Jehu, he says, Have you come in peace, Jehu? How can there be peace, Joram replied, as long as all the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel abound? Joram turned about and fled, calling out to Ahiza, treachery, Ahiza. Then Jehu drew his bow and shot Joram between the shoulders. The arrow pierced his heart and he slumped down in his chariot. This is where Josephus says that he fired an arrow and it went through his heart and he gave up the ghost immediately. Back to the biblical account. Jehu said to Bidkar, his chariot officer, pick him up and throw him on the field that belonged to Naboth the Jezreelite. Remember how you and I were riding together in chariots behind Ahab his father when the Lord spoke this prophecy against him? Yesterday I saw the blood of Naboth and the blood of his servants, declares the Lord, and I will surely make you pay for it on this plot of ground, declares the Lord. Now then, pick him up and throw him on that plot in accordance with the word of the Lord. And when Ahiza, king of Judah, saw what had happened, he fled up the road to Beth Hagen. Jehu chased him, shouting, Kill him too. They wounded him in his chariot on the way up 
but he escaped to Megiddo and died there. His servants took him by chariot to Jerusalem and buried him with his ancestors in his tomb in the city of David. So Jehu just killed both of the kings of Israel in a moment. I've always been amazed at this scene. I mean, both kings in one scene, both kings killed in a moment. Jehu, the bold, ambitious, gangster-like king, murdered two kings right here. Guess who's next? You guessed it, the queen mother herself. 2 Kings 9.30 Then Jehu went to Jezreel, and when Jezebel heard about it, she put on eye makeup and, and arranged her hair and looked out of a window. And as Jehu entered the gate, she asked, Have you come in peace, you Zimri, you murderer of your master? He looked up at the window and called out, Who is on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked down at him. Throw her down, Jehu said. So they threw her down, and some of her blood splattered the wall and the horses as they trampled her underfoot. Jehu went in and ate and drank. Take care of that cursed woman, he said, and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. But when they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands. They went back and told Jehu, said, This is the word of the Lord that he spoke through his servant Elisha the Tishbite. On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh. Jezebel's body will be like dung on the ground in the plot at Jezreel, so that no one will be able to say, This is Jezebel. So Jehu has killed two of the kings and now the queen mother. Um, this is not the end. Of, that we'll hear of the name of Jezebel. Um, we'll talk more of her at the end of this episode. Second Kings 10. Now there were in Samaria 70 sons of the house of Ahab. So Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria, to the officials of Jezreel, to the elders and to the guardians of Ahab's children. He said, You have your master's sons with you and your chariots and horses, a fortified city and weapons. Now as soon as this letter reaches you, choose the best and most worthy of your master's sons, and set him on his father's throne. Then fight for your master's house. But they were terrified and said, If two kings could not resist him, how can we? So the palace administrator, the city governor, the elders, the guardians, sent this message to Jehu. We are your servants who will do anything you say. We will not appoint anyone as king. You do whatever you think is best. Then Jehu wrote them a second letter saying, If you are on my side and will obey me, take the heads of your master's sons and come to me in Jezreel by this time tomorrow. Now the royal princes, seventy of them, were with the leading men of the city who were rearing them. And when the letter arrived, these men took the princes and slaughtered all seventy of them. They put their heads in baskets and sent them to Jehu in Jezreel. And when the messenger arrived, he told Jehu, We have brought the heads of the princes. Then Jehu ordered, Put them in two piles at the entrance of the city gate until morning. The next morning Jehu went out, and he stood before all the people and said, You are innocent. It was I who conspired against my master and killed him. But who killed all these? Know then that not a word the Lord has spoken against the house of Ahab will fail. The Lord has done what he announced through his servant Elijah. So Jehu killed everyone in Jezreel who remained of the house of Ahab, as well as all of his chief men, his close friends, and his priests, leaving him no survivor. Jehu then set out and went through Samaria. At Beth Echel of the shepherds, he met some of the relatives of Ahiza, king of of Judah and asked them, Who are you? They said, We are relatives of Ahiza, and we have come down to greet the families of the king and of the queen mother. Take them alive, he ordered. And then they took them alive and slaughtered them at the well of Beth Echel. Forty two of them. He left no survivor. Now you're probably thinking, Are you really reading this from the Bible? This is crazy. This is crazy stuff. So I am. I mean, the next scene is like something out of Braveheart. It's gritty. It's gritty. The judgment is never clean. And the Baal priest, they're next. Second Kings 10.10 10. Then Jehu brought all the people together and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little. Jehu will serve him much. Now summon all the prophets of Baal, all his servants and all his priests, See that no one is missing, because I am going to hold a great sacrifice to Baal. Everyone who fails to come will no longer live. 
But Jehu was acting deceptively in order to destroy the servants of Baal. Jehu said, Call an assembly in honor of Baal. So they proclaimed it. They sent word throughout Israel, and all the servants of Baal came. Not one stayed away. They crowded in the temple of Baal until it was full from one end to the other. And Jehu said to the keeper of the wardrobe, Bring robes for all the servants of Baal. So he brought robes out to them. Then Jehu went into the temple of Baal. Jehu said to the servants of Baal, Look around and see that no one who serves the Lord is here with you, only servants of Baal. So they went in to make sacrificing and burnt offerings. Now Jehu had posted 80 men outside with this warning. If one of you lets any of the men I've placed into your hands escape, it will be your life for his life. And as soon as Jehu had finished making the burnt offering, he ordered the guards and officers, go in and kill them, let no one escape. So they cut them down with the sword. The guards and officers threw the bodies out and then entered the inner shrine of the temple of Baal. They brought the sacred stone out of the temple of Baal and burned it. They demolished the sacred stone of Baal and tore down the temple of Baal. And people have used it for a latrine to this day. So Jehu destroyed Baal worship in Israel. However, he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam son of Nebat, which he caused Israel to commit, the worship of the golden calves at Bethel and Dan. The Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in accomplishing what is right in my eyes, and have done to the house of Ahab all I had in mind to do, your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. Yet Jehu was not careful in keeping the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, which had caused Israel to commit. In those days the Lord began to reduce the size of Israel. Haziel overpowered the Israelites throughout their territory east of the Jordan and all the land of Gilead, from Aror to the Anarn Gorge, through Gilead to Bashan. Jehu would reign in Israel 28 years, and we saw in this episode he conducted a horrific house cleaning in the house of Ahab. He's going to have a kingdom, and his sons will rule. The first years will be okay, but slowly his power will wane in favor of Haziel. He killed off Baal and Asherah worship violently, but he will remain faithful to the idol calf worship of Jeroboam. Judgment has come to Israel, and in the next episode, we cover the dynastic struggles in Judah when Ataliah receives word that her son was killed and all of her mother's family was murdered in Israel. Her reaction will be just as horrible and violent. To conclude this episode of Message to Kings, we can't end the story of Jezebel here. We'll find the name mentioned again in the book of Revelation, but between the story of the physical living Jezebel and the name again Jezebel in the book of Revelation, we need to follow an historic trail connecting the biblical account to history and spiritual manifestations of her in the book of Revelation. They echo lessons throughout time. Let's start with the Old Testament, Jezebel. She's the murderer of the prophets, Baal worshiper, basically a priestess of dark magic. And since she was married to the king, there must be persuasive and manipulation involved there and control issues. All right, so that's the Old Testament, Jezebel. Let's read the Revelation account of Jezebel. Her name is mentioned in one of the letters to the seven churches. Now, the letters have many different interpretations. Most believe the letters were literal in nature and written to respective churches, encouraging and rebuking them. Other interpretations are they are historic in nature and reveal time frames in church history. Further, they reference differing spirits or types of churches or things that arise in the future. Oh gosh, there, there's so many ways to look at them. Regardless, there was truly churches in the places of these letters, and they were addressed to the angel or some say the pastor of each church. So if I didn't confuse you on all that, here's the account of the letter to the church of Thyatira, which references the name of Jezebel. Revelation 2, 19. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teachings, she must lead my servants into sexual immorality and eating of food sacrificed to idols. 
I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her in a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold on to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give my authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. So it continues. All right, so Jezebel is referred to as a woman that manipulates for evil. Those who are seduced by darkness, dark spiritual secrets, and leading people away from God. Not truly a Baal worshiper in the New Testament, but the spirit appears to be the same in nature and fruit. Further, her judgment is about the same, death and death of her sons. She is just as notorious as the Old Testament reference. These references are just way too similar to not think they're related. Most scholars tend to lump them together as one and the same. Why? Because of the name and the similarities. Let's say this. Jezebel was so evil, she must have been incredibly demon-possessed. And let's just say this. There's another demon-possessed person in the book of Revelation that's doing pretty much the same thing and will get the same reward for what they caused others to do. And if this isn't enough, it's almost like a historical paper trail of sorts is through history. Jezebel's dead, and her sons and daughters are dead, except for one, Athaliah, who has a hold on to power in Jerusalem, and will keep it with extreme violence in a soon episode. But she will find herself dead, because this is what happens to those who claim to be of the same spirit or descendants of Jezebel. Athaliah will die a miserable death as well, so then, if we follow the, the trail of history, where did Jezebel come from? She came from the city of Tyre. Her bloodline branch is gone, but from Tyre is the root. And there's no doubt she was trained in her ways by someone, her family from Tyre. And if Athaliah goes, her bloodline comes from Tyre too, correct? What's interesting is that we can find Jezebel or, the, or, or this same type of spirit continuing through history. Our history trail gets harder to follow, but there's a direct line from Jezebel to her niece, Queen Dido of Tyre. And in a very dramatic and honestly made-for-TV scene, she flees Carthage with a hoard of gold in about 50 years and flees as far away as North Africa and founds the city of Carthage. And we'll cover this story in greater detail in a later episode. But Queen Dido and the founding of Carthage, she comes from Tyre, and she's the niece of Jezebel, and she exports Baal worship all the way to Carthage. And from Carthage, we can find temples to Baal. Archaeology has even discovered child sacrifice and horrific idol worship. It's a continuation of the pollution of the world of that time of Israel, now we see it in Carthage 50 years later. So we arrive at the end of this, and what do you speak to at the end uh, when you have the death of so many characters in our story? And, and I leave it with the uh, historically and spiritually charged thought. Could it be we see even the inner workings of God's judgment, even in the Roman Senate, hundreds of years from now, when Cato the Elder finished every speech with the following statement after the Second Punic War. Furthermore, it is my opinion that Carthage must be destroyed. Archaeological evidence has unearthed many times over the remains of human sacrifices in Baal worship, even in Carthage. In the end, Carthage, like the line of Ahab, was destroyed. We see Jezebel and Ahab's line terminated from the earth. We see Jezebel's more remote family line find refuge and prosperity in Carthage, but even it was destroyed. The lesson is clear. Judgment will come. 
when judgment is announced, it will come. We cannot miss that God will judge the earth. This is inevitable. God must judge the sins of man and the nations for their righteousness or unrighteousness. God forgives and relents and has mercy and grace, but to the unrepentant and to his sworn enemies, the lion must come and will judge the earth. And even a good and righteous judge must still be a judge. There will be a guilty and a not guilty. The guilty will be held accountable for every thought and deed, and the faithful will be as righteous as the one they follow and submit to. The lion of the tribe of Judah will come and judge the hearts of man and the nations of the earth. This will happen in the story of the judgment of Ahab and Jezebel and the end of their family line and the judgment of their descendants throughout history can only be a sign that the judgment of God is certain and only a matter of time. Let us have a new understanding of history from the lenses of the biblical story and the understanding of the powers that be and God's ultimate story throughout time and the certainty of his word, his judgments, his heart throughout history.